under very special circumstances because around 99, to the very beginning 2000, I was uh, invited by uh, Marco De Micheles and Angela Vitese to, to teach in Venice and uh, at the UF, at the, at the university. And I had never taught in my life before. I was always a curator. So I was absolutely nervous. It was the first day you know, of me teaching. I didn't really know what I would tell the students. Um, and I arrived in the classroom, uh, and something amazing happened because I didn't have to say much because there was this amazing student who had just arrived from Argentina to, to Venice and then later to the Shell Schule in uh, Frankfurt called Thomas Saraceno. And uh, Thomas told us amazing stories. It became a truly memorable seminar and a great example that the professor always learns most, you know, from the students. Um, and what, not only that, but Thomas immediately upon arriving in, um, in Venice wanted to go and see the mayor. We had uh, to arrange a meeting for him with the mayor because he said this is really important because he said that we need to learn how to build in the air because Venice is a city which is built on water, but he wanted to teach Venice how to build in air. And um, that was the beginning of many great adventures uh, uh, of really realized utopias which uh, Thomas is, uh, is building. In his very first kind of you know, encounter, he also told our group about a visionary from Argentina called Gyula Kosice, whom I would like to remember here tonight. The great Gyula Kosice who passed away almost 100 years old, a few, a few years ago, uh, was a visionary Argentinian artist, co-founder of, co of the Madi Group, I think, who very much is connected to the theme of what we're discussing here today, because it was all about gravity, how to transcend gravity, how to build entire cities which should go beyond gravity. And that's, of course, what Thomas has been doing for so many years, inventing cloud cities, inventing airport cities, you know, which would float. And uh, many of these experiments have recently been gathered in an amazing exhibition at the Palais de Tokyo called Carte Blanche to Thomas Saraceno, where this exhibition on air could be experienced at the Palais de Tokyo as a whole ecosystem, you know, hosting lots of different choreographies, polyphonies. Uh, and not only was it a great experience of really bringing art, science, engineering together, but it also became one of the most visited, most popular shows of the year, and I think had 200,000 visitors. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Thomas Saraceno. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the invitation. Thank you to be here. Um, I thought it's good to uh, maybe start with a movie uh, after having this fantastic lunch. Uh, who want to sleep? Could sleep. Even we maybe turn down the light a little bit further, then maybe I fall asleep also. After Thomas Hirschhorn sees his beautiful uh, performance where people sleep in the couch and feel comfortable, it was very beautiful and inspiring. Um, now, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know why is the reason, but to a certain extent, um, and also during lunch, there is a certain uh, level of uh, not me being prepared and being here and being able to give a talk and give a speech, which I don't know why um, I like to confront myself to certain high level of um, danger uh, or, or insecurity on why I cannot put the slide together. The presentation that I will put up is like, a, I never have seen it, you know, I keep changing. You know, and the people from Berlin keep sending and the text keep collecting and then, you know, it's full of notes and I don't know what will happen. Um, and this mean it, it, it made me extremely um, nervous. Um, and this mean I thought to calm down a little bit, I, I thought to, to put two things together that as I said before, um, hopefully will resonate or, or this moment of, of grace, uh, it will happen um, and see what happens. Does it mean I will be playing a video and then I will be reading a text and I will try to uh, see if there is a kind of a relationship among them. Uh, as always, I have uh, more or less 400 slides. I should not forget <laughs> the, 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 the timing there. And uh, I lost some minutes, otherwise I will, but okay, somebody help me with the timing and to leave uh, time for the question. And maybe I thought to start right from the, um, somebody asked me when I came out from the lunch, and, and I will try to answer the question of Hans right at the beginning, the unrealized project. Does it mean there was a small, beautiful uh, bag here? Maybe you borrowed me. Uh, 
Yes, beautiful. They asked me to um, uh, design something for the for the bag. And the original design is I mean it became an unrealized project because it's partially here but not yet. But we could maybe start to build it. Was the idea to this is a spider web, but I said it's supposed to be inside. This I mean the outside should be supposed to be nothing, and then you open the bag and you spider web. It's like oh, and you don't want to put anything inside. <laughs> this is me. I thought, um, you know, maybe I can start like a, try to do it because we said, but maybe we can just turn upside down the bag and then the spider web then will be inside, at least partially. This means if whoever wants to do it, it will be in your hands to realize the project that we start to think it might be possible by turning it upside down. Um, uh, then, um, can we really um, uh, slide down the light because it's kind of uh, very, very strong here? Even less. I want to disappear. <laughs> 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 you don't see me. Less, less. Oh, this one. Okay. The, the, um, the project is what I want to talk mostly is about. Uh, um, ah, yeah, that was the first slide. Um, um, about Erosin, and this is what I will focus most about it, the talk and the, what I will be uh, reading. And this I means the reading is really kind of a collection of essays which have been um, around a group of people that we call uh, the Erosin. And this I means it's, it's really kind of a, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, be part of, of, of something which is a little bit beyond uh, um, uh, my own practice and try to really think how we can influence uh, one to each other, how we can try to think together, how we can try to write together, uh, how we can fail together, and uh, how we can try to uh, articulate uh, something which might be among the different disciplines and the, and the way of how we could think about. Um, Falling Upward is the title of a book. Um, I forgot the author. And, uh, and then we live at the bottom of Ocean of Air is also a, a, a sentence by Torricelli, a student of Galileo. Um, that I kind of put them together. Uh, Greece is the absence of gravity. It's feeling you falling. This is mean I change a little bit of quote that uh, uh, Hans put it to the, today, and then I thought that the feeling was something more appropriate. Gravity. Ah, okay. Then there was the astrophysic, which um, was present before. This is something which I always kind of is beautiful, and I think so. It's true. You could, you, uh, you can fact check afterward. But gravity is the weakest force in the universe, but at the same time, it's the more abundant. I mean, it's, it's something, um, thanks to gravity, that we can think about black matter and dark energy and how things and bodies come together. I mean, I love this idea that is the weakest, but the more abundant. I mean, there is this kind of contradiction above both, which I kind of uh, quite like it. Um, let me see if I can play that video. Let's see if it, the sound appears. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Um, I will sit a little bit. <laughs> okay. A bit louder, if possible, the sound. believed that every 11 years, at the beginning of each new solar cycle, major historical events occur. His thought was that, since it changed the sun activity appearance, have an effect in space, the atmosphere, and the Earth's surface, the new as the rest of organisms, and, oh, yeah, yeah, my English is terrible. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm reading. <laughs> Okay, I'll try it again. Then we, as the rest of our games, are not exempt from this effect. We gather a large amount of data, or he gathered a large, large amount of data, observing a historical relation between the highest level of solar activity and the mass revolution of movement. This idea might apply also to a smaller scale where temperature is defined as measures 
of an average molecular motion. Okay, it's getting complicated, no? But he did something which is quite amazing, no? He said, like, every 11 years, the sun is getting closer to, to the Earth. And does it mean what he finds that there is always this kind of correlation between the revolution of planet Earth in relationship with this 11 period time, periodicity? And does it mean usually also the revolution that is happening is from the left side? also, to that extent. And this means what we are trying to do here is an experiment in the University of Chicago that we kind of have these kind of very high um, frequencies and we make levitate particles and these particles are cosmic dust. It's not terrestrial dust, but it's dust who come from outer space. And this means what we are trying with this frequency based on this kind of uh, what are the rhythms of this uh, revolution, what might happen, how planet might be able to assemble according with these different rhythms thinking that also the planet had been forming and we started as a cosmic dust to a certain extent. And now we play this one. Okay, this video is in white sand. Uh, I think it lasts like five or six minutes. White sand is, is in the States is the place where it was the first atomic explosion. Uh, this I mean, is one of the markets of the beginning of the age of the Anthropocene, where these very tiny particles have kind of spread all over the world, and now you can find the strata in different places around the world. And this is why some of them, they think, okay, it might be, what is the materiality of the beginning of the Anthropocene where humans live? And that's the point of the talk, when human lives. That's, I think, so the most problematic point of the Anthropocene. We cannot generalize, and we are not all the same. I mean, what I always try to do in the talk is like some human. The ability to put some before the humans, I think, is crucial. I just arrived yesterday night and I say, well, you know, I'm in the middle of the mountain. There are people here living in Switzerland who are very well attuned and they are not responsible of what is happening today in the planet Earth. I mean, there is this kind of divergence between a re responsibility. What is your ability to respond? As Elisa Stenger has put it also, to the crisis that we are living, that not all are producing this crisis, but most of us, I think, so, um, are suffering the consequences. And I mean, this idea of the human putting everything in one single baggage, I think is very problematic to that extent. I mean, every time I've made a mistake at all, humans as a generalization, I think so, I will always try to stop and then say to some, just to the shake of, try to um, think how we can um, think differently. Fossil fuel-based industry try to colonize other planets. The air, the interface between us and the sun is controlled by fuel. A bit lower. Um, and continue to compromise. Carbon emission fill the air. Particular matters float inside our lungs, while electromagnetic radiation envelops the air, dictating the tempo of digital capitalism in the era of global warming. Irosin proposed an epoch of interplanetary sensitivity, bringing a new ecology of practice, asking how we can, how will be to breathe in a post-fossil fuel economy? And what is our response ability to be on air? How do we challenge social political borders in an age of climate inequality? How to practice in an epoch beyond the Anthropocene toward the decarbonization of the air and towards the independence of fossil fuel? We propose a new epoch called the Irosin. And you see, imagine space as a commons and becomes a physical and imaginary place clear from com uh, corporate control and governmental surveillance. Ariosin proposed the desecularization, free access to the atmosphere, the last, end, uh, the last earthly layer created as a result of the interplanetary forces of the sun, gravity, and the earth mass. Ariosin is a proposal, a scene in, on, for, and with the air. The launch path toward this new epoch is an aerosolar balloon. A do it together entrance to the aerial, whose imagine is only the air and the heat of the sun. And it floats as a result of the temperature, uh, the temperature differential between the two air masses, anywhere from two degrees to up. This means, if you have seen, there is no kind of really magic. And you saw the two person before, Daniel and Dania. Here we are in white sand, and this first of the atomic bomb explosion. It's just like it was a matter of kind of running. I thought today also maybe the lecture should have it completely different because it was beautifully sunny outside. And, um, and when it's sunny and there is little wind, 
right in front of the square. Now it's got a little bit um, uh, in the shadow. But uh, if you want tomorrow morning, we could experience. This I mean, for me, that, what, what I'm talking is very, very simple. It's like a, how you can, and this this moment of grace and reversing gravity, which is very, very beautiful, I think so. Uh, one is, once inflated with air, they are able to elevate into the sky, starts only to the sun, heating in the air, in the interior, afterward rewarding only the wind in order to drift air on its journeys. Uh, then without the use of fossil fuel and without releasing any harm of uh, Okay, in such a way, it called for a new embodied cosmology attuned with the sun, the life-giving star that had been turned into a threat by clouds of black carbon that absorb solar energy and make our planet warmer every day. In this way, the Erosine Epoch becomes a weather-dependent building, a less anthropocentric relationship with the environment, becoming a way to exit from the epistemic isolation and re-entangle ourselves with the surrounding milieu, in this case, the weather. Floating, airborne, without carbon emission, this aerosolar journey speculate about what kind of nomadic socio-political structure might emerge if we could navigate in the river of the atmosphere considering the way in which borders are set by humans. The power of national institutions to decide how can transit policies that dramatically affect vulnerable subjects, humans and non-humans animals. This is to become air nomads, moving from homo economicus to homo flotantis, who is attuned to the planetary rhythms, who in consciousness of living with other humans and non-humans, and who have learned to float in the air, drift and drift with the wind. Plants and animals suffer from climate change, losing their right to mobility, in, unable to physically escape its effects. What are the right of pass, the corridors we need to open in order to return uh, mobility to this species trapped by the fossil fuel regime propagated by some humans? Are you seeing call for the interspecies right of mobility that could reconnect with element sources of energy and with other planetary atmospheres, breaking the boundary of the sublunary and expanding the critical zone of all air-dependent life. We suggest a model for a landscape that balance and, har and harness our relation with the unlimited potential of the sun. This realization requires a thermodynamic leap of imagination just like during the eclipse, when only the absence of land, we became aware of our scale in the shadows of the cosmos. We get a little bit of, of this uh, speculation, which came most like Bronislav Sesinke, friend of Bruno Latour, when we start to think about a proposition of think about a monument for the Anthropocene and all the different stage of metabolic regimes that human have cross. Um, maybe I read it or I talk. What do you prefer? How many minutes we are going there? Oh, we are, okay. I talk better, it go too fast, okay. Um, this means what, what we're trying to think, and then maybe I stop and we open for questions because I get too crazy. Um, the, no, the metabolic regime is all this idea of, you know, human, uh, humans and or human homo sapiens, to that extent, we have been hunter and gatherings before, no? And we will follow the seasons. We will follow um, animals, we will follow, um, um, when plants will um, um, bring fruits, we will kind of, uh, we, we're nomads, basically. And this means the second metabolic regime, we kind of invented agriculture, and we kind of domesticate the sun to a certain extent, and then this nomadism, it kind of uh, uh, start to kind of uh, be lost uh, by the majority of, of humans living on planet Earth, and then we invented the city. It's a way of domesticating the sun, the agriculture. No? We lose this ability of, of, of nomadic life. In the third metabolic regime, we, we, we discover the, the fossil fuel regime, right? And this means a bigger conglomeration after the agriculture revolution kind of start to kind of form and the megalopolis and the way how we live today. Now, the fourth metabolic regime that we argue is what if we really kind of relate differently with the sun as the way that we are relating today? Okay, this was a exhibition. Okay, these are the credits, which is important. 
And this was a worldwide record. I mean, I think so. There were only eight persons in history of homo sapiens on planet Earth who were able to lift up a person in the air without burning fossil fuel. And in that case, um, um, we did it with a 35 vehicle. And I mean, it's something very, very simple, but uh, it seems we have forgotten. I mean, back in, in, in time when I was at NASA in 2009 with 120 scientists, you know what I mean? People who have, uh, you know, being at the ISS, International Space Station, they could not believe that during a weekend, two person, you can build something that you can float at the bottom of ocean of air without uh, uh, burning uh, fossil fuel or without using helium and, and hydrogen. Should we put question up or how we doing? Thank you. <laughs> Thomas, thank you so very much. So we're going to take questions. Uh, do yeah. you want to sit down? Maybe it's uh, yes. maybe we just take the chairs and uh, the more Wonderful. comfortable. Just because sometimes people confuse with the materiality. You know this project, no? This is kind of a collective part of them. It's called Museo Solar, where we collect plastic bags, right? You just tape them together, uh, you make this gigantic canvas, you form an envelope, the sun comes from the horizon, and then it gets up into the air. This means you don't need kind of uh, certain special. <laughs> Another big round of applause uh, for uh, Thomas Saraceno. <laughs> Questions, Thomas, before we open it up to the uh, to all the participants here. You know, I said in the uh, the introduction that you were inspired for many of these experiments yeah. by by Gyula Kosice, yeah. and I think it's important. You know, as Eric Hofstrom always said, that we protest against forgetting. So the mm. memory of such pioneers is important. Uh, you know, we, I spoke earlier this morning about Panamarenko. I think it's important we think of him in relation to that theme and his flying experiments. I wanted yeah. you to tell us about Kula Kosice, yeah. your meetings with him and yeah. his incredible visions yeah. of, 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 of cities defying gravity. Yeah. Really. No, there is a beautiful popular song uh, writer, Atahualpa Yupanqui, from Argentina. <laughs> Um, and since in, uh, you know, in many places it's kind of an oral tradition of knowledge, no? you don't have. But every time he says, is when an old man dies in the village, it's like you'll burn an entire uh, library of the form of knowledge you have. And I think so, Hans is this um, um, alive internet connecting everybody and knowing anything from everybody. And this was said by Rax Media also, by the way, it's not something that I invented. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy that you bring back um, Eula in that extent, which was a, a quite influential person. And in the time that I was studying architecture in, in, in Buenos Aires, and then I was very always fascinated by, the, by this idea of articulating. No? He was always talking about this hydrospatial city, um, kind of uh, with the power of the levitation, of you know, the, the catalyzation of the water, he will be able to, to levitate these, these cities in the air. And he had this beautiful book uh, where he always kind of uh, speculate about, um, you know, in architecture, usually you define spaces, okay, this is a living room, this is a bathroom, this is a toilet. He will have these kind of uh, maps of the uh, hydrospatial city, and every space, he will kind of change it in a completely uh, speculative manner. As to the extent, it's like uh, this is the space to forget um, um, the knowledge of the present and, and, and fuse with the sun. You know what I mean? A, 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 with a beautiful poetic, it's, it's like, almost like a, a condensation of Italo Calvino, um, uh, invisible cities in kind of a sentence, which define the space in a, in a you know, for me, it's the moment, you know, when, when Thomas also said, it's the moment that you sleep, you know, and you forgot. Well, it's not anymore the exhibition, right? It's, a, it's kind of awareness uh, um, lost in the moment uh, that, um, that I think so it was very beautiful. And you will we talk about, about it. about, you know, poetry. Um, sorry. We talked about poetry. You know, we talked about literature. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about science, you know, in relation to, to the theme, because you had a work, actually, um, which I saw in Rome at the Maxi, I think, mm. which was, uh, you know, these aerostatic balloons. It connects to what you mm. showed us. It was gravity imaging the universe, you know, after mm. Einstein. But you also, you know, and I was wondering kind of if you can tell us a little bit about that, you know, about the idea of imagining the universe after Einstein and what's the kind of difference in our knowledge and perception of the universe before mm. and 
after I mean. No, I'm, I'm more, more thinking about um, the question that I'm asking, and I'm asking also to the scientists, uh, to a certain extent, is um, it go beyond the human? And this, I mean, all the words that we do with the spiders, um, it's kind of, again, re-entangled with this form of knowledge, which I think so. For example, the question we have been doing at Palais Tokyo, and then with Lisa Randall and other people, which was kind of uh, interesting, the conversation, uh, is always, you know, for example, you know, population in, in, in the past, in Papua New Guinea, when a tsunami was happening, um, people will know exactly the behavior of the ants, because they, the ants will feel the, the shaking of the earth. And then because the tribe, they will see the ants will go up the mountain. The people living in, in that mountain, they will follow the ants. They will go up, and when a tsunami hits, nothing will happen. This means what is happening in science, and this is what I'm trying to ask is like, when will be the time that a non-human will, will win a Nobel Prize? And the scientists look at me, it's like, how could be? Because they're obsessive. You know what I mean? And when I talk with, do you understand the relationship? Is give the Nobel Prize to the ants because they're the best sensor ever in the world who can forecast and predict much better than all the, our technology. That is a they're great to, idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is mean, and then. And then, and then Lisa Randall, a very famous uh, cosmologist, said, Thomas, this is a wonderful idea, but I think so. A big leap will be if a woman uh, win a Nobel Prize first in physics. <laughs> this, I mean, we are quite very behind on the sensitivity of the inequality of the world we are living. And I think so there are many steps that we have to go through. To, through, you know, and very genders and patriarchy. Very <laughs> urgent. The problem that we are living today on the earth. And this, I mean, I'm putting it now with the animals, but I think so we are quite far out. But also you talked about gravitational waves, you know, and uh, uh, I wanted to go a bit deeper on that. Gravitational waves, you know, waves evoke an analogy often used by scientists, the comparison between, you know, 3D spider webs, which you had in many of your recent exhibitions yeah. and our, you know, spongy universe with galaxies morphing into war-like sheets, leaving huge voids of nearly empty space. It connects to this idea also of the void. Can you tell us a little bit about the gravity waves? Because they were observed actually rather recently, I think 2015 or 16. Yeah. It's a recent discovery. I wanted, wanted to hear more. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I'm not the best to talk about that. But I always say, like, you know, it's like, I mean, for me, it's beautiful because we always thought that the, the piece at Palais Tokyo was this idea of jamming and being together. And then, uh, you know, and, and then not try to divide, you know, who is the participant of the exhibition. This means the, the text of who are the credits. I think it's so approximately, I don't know, 600 names or more. I mean, it was all the time of saying, okay, who was living at the Palais de Tokyo? And then we, the first approach was, you know, we found out that more than 600 uh, alive spiders that were living at the Palais de Tokyo for a very long time. And this means we start to pay attention to them. We decide to put microphones and we try to decide also, okay, what they are able to sense. And this means are also able to sense these kind of gravitational waves, which for me is quite inspirational because it's, it's the moment that, um, you know, time and space collapse. And this means really the moment that, you know, when these waves pass um, uh, through you, you became very small and then you became large. It really it changed even physically. Your body has a billion of a billion of a millimeter, something uh, absurd. But, uh, but nevertheless, it, it changed these parameters of... of uh, and then I just was now in San Francisco about, uh, you know, space travel, warm time capsule and, and quantum leaps and so forth. I mean, yes, I love um, also to think about that different uh, modes of uh, um, reality. But, uh, but I think so, you know, it's always this idea, learn to fly with a feet on the ground. I think so there is all the time this kind of, um, um, we cannot kill that imagination of, 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 of that way of thinking, but uh, there is this kind of ability to respond to a certain extent and how we can respond together to that extent that I'm curious. And I'm so much, Thomas. We can now open it up for all your questions. We've got a question here. You can have the microphone. Thank you, Thomas. Always most Bye -bye. inspiring. Mm -hmm. For me, Aerosin is a real example of power of art that when it brings, like, like you said, you know, jamming together, all of us. And as you know, I was in Davos this week at the World Economic Forum, and it was a real lack of grace, and uh, it was a real lack of uh, possibilities and reimaginations of uh, a new architecture, or new structures that we need to build, and I see Aerosin as a such uh, a new community. Can you share a little bit with us more? How do you see 
uh, aerosene can be one of the potential models to building a new community mm -hmm. to bring this responsibility for uh, humanity and the planet uh, mm -hmm. forward. <laughs> it's too big a question. But uh, uh, no, in practical terms, what, are, what are we trying to put up? I don't know. I'm kind of so happy. There was a beautiful article in New York Times that finally all the people who thought uh, speculate with cryptocurrency and the tokens and all these kind of value change finally have gone. And then now suddenly the people who are really interested in thinking about a shared economy, you know, there will be space and, and, and space uh, and time for them to, to start to really work and, and kind of try to build up uh, something which is really uh, different of what was the, the shared economy that had been proposed. This means we are trying to move with the Aerosyn community on kind of, to a certain extent, what we, you know, how we can kind of uh, evaluate a single contribution that each of us uh, produce within, the, within that community. And this means really, to a certain extent, it's kind of uh, retribute or invent this kind of token that we don't know if will be kind of exchanged for which value, but it's gonna try to, for example, collect miles and more. You mean every time that we come up and we move, and me also, I'm kind of uh, proud to collect miles because then I can fly somewhere else. And it's completely shameful, right? In the, we call global time, and then we enter into the elite, and then suddenly I have the golden card and the platinum, and you say, oh my God, you know what I mean? Look how far we have get of not really kind of be conscious about that thing. And you know that when you get flying business, when first class is, between two and three times more that if you fly an economy, the carbon emission that you are producing. This means you enter in kind of a, a, a circuit that I'm also part that is kind of completely, um, and it, you know, and this means how we can then, now with the aerosene, you know, and then we are trying to kind of have a virtual fly, a tether fly, and a free fly. Uh, and this means you have also categories as an aeroplane. You have X, Z, and you multiply according with the practice. I mean, just for giving you an idea, every time we launch a free fly balloon, it's quite complicated. And this means if you do a free fly with these balloons, um, you earn five times uh, uh, miles than if you do a feather. If you do a virtual also, you earn much less. This means a, a, a free fly, you have to have an insurance of over 2 million euro in case you crash with an airplane. Um, <laughs> you have to translate uh, uh, the policy to every country that you will cross the airspace. This means the paperwork that you have to do to release these objects into the air is quite uh, um, um, heavy demanded. Um, and this means, but I'm happy that we are having conversation with the European Minister of Transportation of trying to open up these corridors, no? Uh, and this means really, every time we launch one of these cultures from Berlin, we end up always, there is kind of a constant wind which is towards uh, Lithuania, Poland, and the border of Russia. Is, I mean, if you have a TGV, we have a kind of a constant corridors where people from transportation talk about it, that we have to kind of, kind of now start to kind of um, um, decarbonize and occupy with another more maybe civilian or artistic or embodied uh, presence, I think so, which is quite uh, important. More questions? For, we can take, I think, two or three more questions for Thomas. No more. I wanted to follow up on we this question. We made it then. But I wanted to follow up on this question, <laughs> this question from before. <laughs> Thomas, the question from before. I have a follow up question on that, which is interesting. You know, because, of course, in Switzerland, you have Big Cars Initiative with the solar airplane. And yeah. uh, Olaf Eliasson you know, works with Ottesen from Denmark on a project for a solar airplane. Have you ever looked into that? Yeah. I mean, I had a talk uh, in a space Morel. When was uh, Barbara? Uh, two, three? Yeah, three, four years ago, that I have a conversation one to one with Picard. Picard was here. I was here. And I mean, it's quite astonishing how. Um, I, I try to move quickly because, I mean, this is one, when, when the sun comes down, this will come down, right? This is, I mean, uh, it's really solar dependent. Okay, this is the one that, uh, I'll try to go back. I brought here to um, Zeus, uh, and tomorrow we could make a flight. Uh, this mean, these are always black, and we can do the drawings. This is when we launch it. <laughs> this is when we do the, the fly. We live in, in Berlin, approximately 600 kilometers in that case. It's very slow, my computer, that it doesn't go through. Oh, it closed the program. Anyway, the, uh, here we are. This, I mean, this is a kind of a copy of, of something that the CNES, the French Space Agency, have been doing in, starting in the 60s and end up the program in 82. Quite surprisingly, and I feel guilty not to contribute yet properly to the Wikipedia article on Solar Balloon, which is very, very small and niche. Picard didn't know about that. This 
type of balloons in 72 and 82. They did three times around the world without burning fossil fuel and just being moved by the wind. This mean, because, I mean, it's still the simplicity what I'm trying to say, and you know, it's just air and sun and an envelope. Because got crazy. I mean, we are, there's always this kick, this kind of, um, you know, you, where is the battery? There's no battery. The battery is the, the planet Earth. This means during the day, it flies for approximately 40 kilometers heated by the sun. But the sun, when come down, what it heat up the air, which is inside it? The Earth. The balloon come down to 20 kilometers, pick up the infrared radiation. Is the temperature, you know, when you touch the asphalt till during the evening, this heat goes back and then stabilizes at 20, then goes up. It's been a beautiful choreography of movement of these sculptures who could travel around the world. It's been, they stop it. They don't fly anymore because the Earth says more populated policy legislation and thing. And Picard didn't know about that thing. It's been, you know, and then we open up in the Grand Palais. We show two of these pieces during the COP21 when Paris was signed the agreement. And I cannot hope and wait that this type of uh, forgotten type of technology again kind of uh, bring it back. We have a question in the front row. If you can have the mic, and then a question from Svetlana. Can you have the question, the microphone to the front uh. row? Thank you. Uh, how closely are you working with um, the academia and environmentalists, or how is that a cooperation with these, well, interdisciplinary methods, but particularly, I imagine, not only working with scientists, but advancing this for other people as well that are in the yeah. same kind of research, yeah. and equally with policymakers? Yeah. Well, it is a mix, you know, I mean, we have people in Erosin from Pablo Suarez, from Red Cross is a long term collaborator, we have been in a couple of places. Pablo always takes his backpacks everywhere it goes, and it's been that he's, uh, from that extent, uh, uh, something with Red Cross. Then we work with uh, Nick Shapiro, which is part of a, um, a public lab, which I think so is one of the, the, high, the, the biggest environmental justice uh, community in the world. I think so, approximately 7,000 scientists who really kind of make grassroots uh, movement on trying to battle uh, people who suffer. Uh, you know. Uh, no, it's public lab. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a community of people who work about uh, environmental justice thing, and then they kind of build sensor uh, uh, when people start to sense that something is wrong with the environment. And this mean, you know, people living near areas where fracking is happening, um, and then people start to have high degrees of cancer, and they don't know what is happening. They don't know what's happening. They call public lab, 7,000 team up together. They say well, it's usually sensor to start to. Measure this particular matter in the air is very expensive, over 200,000 euros. And it's been people in the community, they cannot build that sensor. And they call public lab, and this means called by the man, right? It's in public lab, they hack and they crack that sensor, they give it back to the community, and they get it all the data required, and then they can, they can fight the case toward the companies which are producing something we don't know yet that it might be harmful for humans. And this I mean, that's the way that we do. This means we kind of, you know, with different, um, 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 and then, you know, mostly now we're um, um, Violeta Bulk, which is the, uh, your sister, Barbara, friend, cousin <laughs> uh, 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 of the European Minister of Transportation on trying to deal with that thing. This means, you know, it, it kind of go uh, very, um, Diverse. Something we deal with architecture, and something with art, and uh, yeah, whoever wants to participate is is welcome. We're out of time, but there is a urgent last question yeah. from Svetlana. If you can have the mic here, and then one very short question and short answer. Thank sure. you. What do you think if we could overcome gravity and experience space without moving by contemporary in future knowledge of quantum physics? Virtual reality and telepathy. Yeah, but look, I tell you something which is very beautiful. Santos Dumont and, and some other, what, the very beautiful work. Uh, you are experiencing something which is called stillness in motion. I will answer your question tangentially. I have to hurry up. Okay. Stillness in motion. When you move um, in a hot air balloon which have a burner, you always have a speed of ascension usually is 50 meters per second. Uh, when you are in a car, when you are in a bicycle, when you are in windsurf, or you have also something which have fr uh, friction against. When you are in a solar balloon and, and you are not feather, you move with the wind and you become the wind. It's called stillness in motion. You don't feel anymore that you are moving because you became the wind. This means frictionless. And I mean, it's quite, quite beautiful because uh, you could be moving, you see just 
couple of few meters down there, a tree shaking. And then you are in the balloon in an open gondola, and I can be talking with hands, and this hair will not move one millimeter. And then your brain cannot reconcile. It's like, how the hell is very windy down there? But you are the wind. And it's been that, you know, the jam that we are trying to think, you know, it's like, how, you know, the wind stopped to be there, because you are the wind. And that's the stillness in motion movement that we are trying to speculate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. A big applause for Thomas Saraceno. It's now my immense, immense pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Isabel Nolan, who has a very expanded practice which involves sculptures and paintings and textile works, photographs, writing, works on paper. And it was actually quite soon after we had one of our Zuots brainstormings with uh, uh, Philip, with Beecher, with Daniel, with Christina, thinking about that theme, that I went to Dublin. Uh, it was basically for a day of research to make studio visits with our friend Rachel Thomas. Um, and we arrived in Isabel's studio. I realized that Isabel had actually not only created a portrait of uh, Simone Weil, that gravity and grace were all over the theme of a recent exhibition she had done at the Douglas High Gallery, um, actually uh, called calling on gravity, which has a lot to do with um, what Simone Weil writes when she says all the natural movements of the soul are controlled by laws analogous to those of physical gravity. Grace is the only exception. And so, uh, you know, we talked with Isabel about those exceptions, saw many portraits of Giordano Bruno, the theologian and cosmological theorist. You already mentioned Simone Weil, but also the great Paul Tick, and of course also Tony Soprano. So we're very, very delighted that uh, Isabel is going to give us now a talk. And please give a very, very warm welcome to the amazing Isabel Nolan. I'm sorry, I have a technological question. I don't know how to operate this. Somebody can help me. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, is this? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, that's quite straightforward. So hello, um, I'm gonna do the opposite and I'm gonna bathe myself in life and move around. Um, so when Hans Ulrich came to the studio last year, he asked me if I draw every day, which I think a good artist is probably supposed to do. But I realized that the only thing that I do every day is lie on the floor. And sometimes I lie on the floor because I'm kind of tired or sleepy, but generally horizontality, it somehow, it seems to help me think and to concentrate. And occasionally with a kind of great pleasure, I'll drift into that kind of altered state that precedes sleep. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this one, uninvited imagery and these sort of weird ideas arrive to mind. And when I was thinking about it after the studio visit, I was wondering if this might be a reason that the English word lying means to be both to be untruthful and also to be supine. So this is me busy installing an exhibition, which is a very familiar sight uh, to anybody who has worked with me. So it's somehow, I think, as if greater proximity to the surface of the earth makes us somehow kind of duplicitous. It makes us inventive and it makes our minds receptive to the subterranean world of lies beneath us. And the thing is that physical lowness or horizontality, it's often used as a metaphor for lacking control, for surrendering. So you have these phrases like taking something lying down, not standing on your own two feet, sleeping on the job, and these all imply some kind of failure to be in command. And this belief that the earth is this changeable, corrupt realm, and it's conflated with horizontality and with lowness, and moreover with carnality, with sleep, and with death and animality. This might sound partisan, but it seems to be ubiquitous in thousands of years of human thought. And in a very kind of marked contrast, the sky is a sort of symbol of eternity, of uprightness, and of freedom and divinity and grace. And this prejudice that all that is up is good and a horror of that which brings us down, like gravity, it pertains, I suspect, directly to the way that grace is often discussed as if it's a kind of corrective to the offenses of gravity. So verticality or height, it's assumed, gives us the reason, it gives us the control or the spiritual grace that our low animal nature wants or lacks. 
I suspect it's not true, or it's neither true nor false, to say that grace is actually in conflict with gravity, because there's a lot of assumptions that follow from the inference that it, uh, the inference that it is. Okay. So I'm beginning at the beginning. Um, I am going to discuss four artworks, but first I want to talk about Lucy. So Lucy, I'm sure many of you know, was a member of the species Australopithecus afarensis, and her fossilized remains were dug up in Ethiopia in 1974, 3.2 million years after she was born. And it's thought that she died at about 12 years of age, a fully mature young adult, and she was only about 1.1 meter tall. And her lone ankle suggests that Lucy was flat-footed, but it's her valgus knee, that is her knocked knee, that's the key indicator that Lucy walked on two feet. So after our ancestors had, as a species, stood up, humans, and maybe extinct hominins like Lucy, began to inhabit this distinction that we make between the earth and the sky, between up and down, and between body and mind. And the world, in upright Western minds at least, it becomes somehow discontinuous with itself. Hierarchies of space appeared, and it leads us to see the sky as something out there, as above, rather than something that surrounds us from our feet up. So our bodies, our feet in particular, they come to, <clears throat> they've kind of come to represent that part of us which is constrained by nature, which is in contact with the surface of the earth, with the world of change and death and decay, whilst our minds and our souls look to eternity for answers. Australopithecus were probably equally comfortable moving through the trees as they were on foot. So I keep wondering, did Lucy have a sense of up and down? And might a being who lived 3.2 million years ago had a concept of gravity and grace, or a concept of reality and correspondingly of unreality or imagination? And did she unthinkingly sense that she was of the world, or did she feel, as most of us do, somehow separate from it? I'm really interested in Lucy because I'm interested in how important being upright is to human thought. Um, it's also a way of sort of flagging a kind of foolish fascination that I have, which might be slightly mystical, which will take me back to Simone and Bruno and people, with the idea that once we occupied a world that was not formulated in terms of these binaries of earth and sky, gravity and grace, body and mind, but as a continuum and ourselves indivisible from it. And I wonder if by testing the reality of this kind of constructs with works of art, if we can find connection where there seems to be difference or opposition. So usually the relationship between gravity and grace is couched as a kind of negotiation of control, of freedom and agency, overcoming involuntary constraint. But I think beauty is not necessarily predicated on grace, on transcending gravity. I think rather it's a fusion or even kind of a confusion of both gravity and grace, which affirmatively affirms our human in-betweenness, which blurs the distinctions that we readily inhabit. So with this in mind, as a human who thinks quite a bit about verticality whilst I'm lying on the floor, I'm going to discuss some things made by people other than me, which have been very inspiring to me, though. Works that I sense undermine these kind of simple divisions and revel in in-betweenness and in confusion. <clears throat> so I'm losing my voice already. This is Lovenmensch. I first saw Lovenmensch's image online many years ago. They were a he and then a she, but now consensus has shifted again, and though known as line man in the anglophone world, I prefer line human. So line human, above all else, looks to me like a being who works very hard to join the heavens and the earth. So I made this rug to give some form to that thought. And he was made, I suspect, by somebody who sensed that the world is not necessarily only what it appears to be. So he has a cave lion head and four limbs and then the body of a short-legged human. And this was carved from a mammoth tusk around 38,000 BCE. It's the oldest known fabricated figurative sculpture and it's, this has been reconstructed from 268 tiny fragments of ivory and it's absolutely exquisite. It's only 31.1 centimeters tall and every atom of it I think is suffused with a mystery. All of these cracks and gaps, it's an incredible piece of work. So it lives in a museum in Ulm but finally we met last year in real life because Lion Human was displayed in the British Museum. And I was completely prepared to be disappointed but the object has a mesmeric power that's utterly disproportionate to its size. 
So Living with the Gods was the exhibition in the British Museum, and it posited that beliefs in spiritual beings and worlds beyond nature are characteristic of all human societies. And Line Human was the poster boy for the exhibition. And it strikes me that the birth of spirituality or supernatural belief is a very heavy weight for this creature, the oldest piece in the show to carry. But very frequently, the artifacts of the Upper Ice Age are correlated with these enormous metaphysical claims, the birth of religiosity, belief in the supernatural, the emergence of humanity, of a soul that separates us from the animals. But I wonder, does this figure have much more prosaic origins, even profane ones? And it strikes me that this could be a nascent artistic provocation, simply testing the nature of reality, or even a proto-scientific exercise, this kind of peculiar document of trying to figure out what would happen if a lion and a human were able to mate. <clears throat> and I think it just could have been produced by somebody... Oh, sorry, forget that. So lion human... My favorite idea is that lion human is just the protagonist of a very, very ancient bedtime story. Um, so it looks to me like the work, so he's only this size, just in case it's worth emphasizing. He looks very monumental in these photographs. It looks like the work of a hominin that had discovered that narrative and meaning are as malleable as clay, which is an enormous but not a metaphysical claim. Ivory was slowly shaped and something completely unreal was brought into being, into reality. And you can see that line human's mouth turns up a little on the side, so he looks thoughtful. And his completely unnatural stance looks purposive. I think it's as if human posture has gifted him with the reasoning intellect. So perhaps even 40,000 years ago, verticality was the basis of rationality, of animal instincts left behind. The lion's head is elevated. The animal's power, its captivating terror, is somehow tamed by human form. And standing on tiptoe, straight-legged, straining to escape the earth or its nature, perhaps it is a simple story of grace overcoming gravity, of reason overcoming instinct. But equally, it might tell of power drawn from animal nature, of self-consciousness superseded by killer instinct. And we will never know because there's a complete vacuum of information that surrounds its production. So Lion Human, it's worth noting, can't stand on his own two feet. He must be propped up. And I keep imagining now the creator of Lion Human carrying him about like a baby and showing Lion Human all of the ruptures that his appearance made apparent in the world between human and animal, between earth and sky, between body and mind, horizontal and upright and gravity and grace. And I don't know whether such gaps were exaggerated or somehow closed by Lion Human's uprightness and in-betweenness, but undoubtedly an object such as this changed reality and it changed what the world could mean. So I'm speeding through time. <clears throat> so this is Dora Forest, carved around 440 BCE, a Roman copy of a Greek original. His curtailed power, his almost kind of, I think, pornographic rune and contrapposto elegance, it seems as perfect to me, perfect conflation of fantasy, of reality, of power and intimacy. And orbiting the work, this kind of inhuman but radiant stone flesh is very suggestive. It invites you to touch, but it's forbidding and has this kind of derelict perfection that insists that you keep some distance. And here, I think gravity and grace are in straightforward tension. I had a complete fixation with this sculpture, basically a crush on it at one time. I carried its postcard with me all the time. But it was really, it was because of high buildings. Um, so these high and upright buildings like temples and cathedrals and museums and all of these edifices that use height to impress, to worship, to intimidate and to overwhelm, they completely overwhelm me. And it's a great and it's an often time, it's a kind of a libidinal pleasure to surrender to the force of these places. These buildings that defiantly and brilliantly and beautifully harness gravity to impose or to inspire feelings of grace. And on the thresholds of these places, without needing to consciously think it, I'm, also, I'm so aware that shortly all of the atoms that are temporarily me-shaped will be deployed elsewhere in this increasingly disorderly universe. And this kind of cosmic irrelevance, it's not quite the awe or the revelation that I think Semper, the chief architect of the Kunsthistorische Museum, intended with his very high-minded schemes, but these kind of aesthetic intimations of oblivion, they make me very happy and very receptive. So navigating these places, <clears throat> 
my kind of nervous pleasure will sometimes dissipate because the knowledge that this act of surrender to the commitments of church fathers, of monarchs, of industrialists and autocrats is deeply problematic bills. And I'm no longer drifting around these places, but I'm sort of stalking them. They're very highly cultivated and I'm compelled and I'm alienated by the ferocity of their civilization. And in those moments, I feel like I've ceded all control to external splendor, and I become prey to infatuations. And my love for these places, combined with their sort of immense distant authority, it makes me crave intimacy. So when the ostentation of Vienna, where I spent a few months, the grandeur and the upward sweep of its architecture and the sickening concentration of riches and objet d'art, it succeeded in sort of dazzling me and captivating me and overwhelming me, and I felt really ignorant and very, very poor. I became physically obsessed by this maimed warrior from the Kunsthistorische Museum's collection. So in a similar vein, after descending from the kind of vertiginous heights of London St. Paul's Cathedral, I skirted the interior walls and I was trying to avoid all the oppressive and high, empty, God-shaped dome space. And I happened upon this statue of John Donne and it was part pleasure and part relief. And Don, I found out later, he's a very famous British poet, but he had also been the Dean of St. Paul's. And in April 1631, one month before his death, he modeled for this memorial sculpture. A painter was hired to make a life-size drawing, and though gravely ill with stomach cancer, Don knots himself head to toe inside his burial shroud, and he stands on a specially made wooden model of a funeral urn. So the resulting Got the resulting foot, this is a, well, yeah, you can see this is an engraving based on the lost original portrait. So this resulting full length portrait was set by his deathbed. And one year on, this altogether unique upright funerary statue, unlike nothing that had preceded it, carved by master craftsman Nicholas Stone, was installed in the cathedral. And very, very, very instantly, I was struck. You don't quite get it in the photographs, but the surface of the stone is like silk. It's so beautifully carved. It has these gravity-defying ruffles of fabric, and of course, John's face. He meets death not with this sort of standard, dutiful, holy expression, but with this look of private rapture. And the gaunt face of the drawing is made youthful again. There's a hint of smile lifting the corners of his mouth, and I just think he's very beautiful. But what sustained my attention were his knees, they're very slightly but unmistakably bent, and you have these smooth kneecaps that are separated by these vertical kind of labial ripples of fabric. And this bend introduces an animating moment of uncertainty, of downward movement to this otherwise upright statue, and I think it completely disrupts its modest and kind of graceful piety. His knees suggest an ordinary fallibility. It's maybe it's the onset of fatigue, maybe it's doubt, and maybe it's gravity's sickly pull. But Don, it turns out, he was not posing for an ordinary ecclesiastical portrait in stone. He was acting out his future resurrection. He is a <clears throat> he's a lover on the verge of a long-desired consummation. He's caught between heaven and earth. He's on the verge of witnessing an everlasting dawn, and his lips are curving, ready to kiss Christ. His hands are stirring because he's about to shed his robes and be reacquainted with his bodily self. So Don is enacting this quiet ecstasy, this fierce hope that he has of dwelling bodily, I quote him, forever and ever, and infinite and super infinite forevers. So maybe his legs are not weak, they're tense. The knees are not bent with illness and age, but flexing, and they're ready to take a kind of momentous step from this urn, which perhaps he defiantly or even ironically mounts. And with this thought, it's, this sort of transforms then from being a kind of morbid pedestal into being a springboard to the next dimension. So his desire to face change, to stage manage his transition from life to death to eternity with this performance in stone. I think it's a kind of testament to, a testament to receptivity, to fear, to vulnerability, and to human in-betweenness. And it's done with incredible imagination and style and even kind of wit. So I think this willingness to perform in extremis and to will what is unimaginable into reality is beautiful. I think this is a work of grace that's transfigured for the better by gravity. Excuse me. So, as you can see, the main component 
of this final work is a table held approximately 45 centimeters off the ground, and the surface of it is penetrated between the front legs by this hat of the large kind of Disney-like dwarf who faces forward and gives direction to the work. Two chairs support the table's our back legs, and four more chairs are in pursuit, and still more sit up top, sorry, I'm getting confused. So other elements include empty bottles, fake fungi, crockery, and a disarrayed tablecloth. And attached to the table's underside is an upside-down paint-daubed dog. It has eggshells on its inverted tummy, and suspended around it are handkerchiefs that are like a little gang of textile ghosts. Stuck to various surfaces of the table are many scribbled notes, drawings, and photographs. So Dwarf Parade by Paul Tech, it was first displayed in 1969, but it was remade and re-shown in various guises with quite a lot of startling variation. And at times it involved potted plants, stuffed swans, candles, pillows, logs. And each instance is a kind of perplexing concatenation of things. And the parade of the title, I think, is echoed by the way that these diverse objects array themselves in a kind of body line, a line that's drawn in the world by the work. So there's some sense of it, I think, originating in the interruption of a raucous party. Booze was consumed, the order of things was upended, spillages and odd inversions have occurred, and things went very badly for the dog. I conventionally imagined that the dwarf was the host because his rictus grin and his blank eyes, they kind of draw mine to the suspect toadstools, and each variant of the tabletop somehow got smashed over his head. He and it are stuck with each other. So it's tempting to keep listing these constituent parts to try and draw all of these elements together and to kind of construct a complete picture to come up with a cogent interpretation, but for me it goes nowhere. Yet this whole shambolic ambulatory object, it coheres in a profoundly peculiar and confusing way. I think that it's trying hard to make some progress to transcend its condition, but it cannot or will not conceal its shame and its suffering, its reliance on alcohol to escape earthly woes. So the work is playful, it's tra tragic, and I think it's bizarrely uplifting. It might be trapped by its own efforts and by its comical condition, it's parading dysfunction and death, but it's also celebratory and degraded in a really good way. It's beautiful. Joyous, unruly, disobedient, each element sort of escapes the senseless tableau just as much as it comprises it. And this seems to me a very, very human and a very in-between condition. So seeing it in Kunstmuseum Luzern in 2012, <clears throat> I had this sense of being fully present and alert, but I also found its reality so fascinating, so consuming that there was no room for my own thoughts. And I remember circling it, I even got down on my knees to look at it from below, trying hard not to miss any element or any detail. And I vividly recall finding it incredibly moving and so arresting, and all the while I knew it was completely ludicrous to be so touched, so physically engaged, so captivated and bewildered by a cluttered table penetrated by a cartoon dwarf in a big white room in Switzerland. I was in a state of intense and thrilling ignorance. This work makes the world absurdly present. It tests and it kind of disrupts reality with glee and with rigor. And I think when a work is this good, occupying space in such a singular way and utterly possessed of its own particularity, understanding falters. This work demands and defies our scrutiny. So this image, it looks like this document of some crazed corner of reality, but I think it feels like the daily failure to ever really understand the world. And when gravity and grace are in such perfect disarray, an artwork makes the borders of our own conceptual framework somehow visible, and it exposes them for the constructs that they are. And this sense of active surrender, that thrill attendant on negotiating our relationship with oblivion, with reality, and moreover, the mental and physical and difficult demand of looking and looking when you know that sight alone is not near enough to take in certain works, that's beauty. Your skin and your body is feeling the work too. So I'm very nearly finished. I've had for many years now a sense that the gravitational forces exerted by artworks operate not on the Newtonian principles that pertain in our lived experience on the surface of the earth, but they work much more in line with the language of general relativity. Of course, there's no scientific basis to this. 
But nevertheless, I've had a few really unforgettable encounters with artworks, like the ones I've just talked about, with objects that convince me that they can alter the shape and passage of space and time. And time somehow passes unevenly in this rapture of being with the work and slowly attending to these pieces with one's whole being, with one's whole being the world closes in. Space and reality bends, light shifts, and an hour goes by in the slow blink of an eye. And with these protracted moments of perplexing revelation, an intense encounter with reality is made, and that undifferentiated meeting with world. And I think such beauty enables us to love the reality of the in-between human world, even whilst we sort of hate it. That's it. <laughs> Simone and Erin. There they are. Isabel, thank you so, so much. Let's sit down. It's great we have your works uh, in the background. Thank you so much for this amazing um, talk. And uh, actually, one thing I wanted to ask you is, in a recent lecture uh, you gave, you talked about the universe. And it kind of connects to many things also Thomas Sarazeno talked about. You said just because the universe is probably real, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not weird or puzzling to be here. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because oh it seems God. to be connected to our theme. Well, I guess one of the things is that I, I think is interesting about humans is that even though that I think the universe is largely indifferent to our, or is entirely indifferent to our existence and the universe has no idea that we're here, we struggle and we work incredibly hard to try and make being here meaningful. And we invent a lot of different kind of constructs and a lot of different ways of um, explaining reality to ourselves in order to, I think, make it a more comfortable place to exist. And to, to like talk back to what Rivita was talking about, to overcome this sense that some people seem to find terrifying about how small, we're like mayflies and we're only here for a few seconds. But I mean, as to the puzzling bit, in a way I can only speak to it personally, because I'm very fascinated by all the different ways that scientists and poets and uh, theologians and all sorts of different people have found of narrativizing reality and bringing it into sense and making it possible to uh, give shape to our existence and to the world. Um, but whilst I'm fascinated by all of these different ways, I'm not particularly invested in any of them. And I'm in a state of perpetual confusion. And you sort of alluded to the sort of diversity of you know, the kind of materials and things I use. And when I get asked about that, like by students or something, I, I usually begin with the line that I have to use multiple kind of materials because I'm confused in multiple ways. So that's it. Now also, you know, there is an interesting connection to, to literature. And of course, you know, this eat this year started with a book. And um, there are many connections you have to to literature, to philosophy, to reading. It's interesting also that there is, of course, an incredible link always in, in, in Ireland between art and literature. I mean, the first time I came there, I actually found a book on Seamus Heaney and Gravity mm -hmm. and Grace. It's something Seamus Heaney wrote um, a lot about. But there are lots of writers who influence you. There is Hardy, there is George Eliot, mm. there's Hamlet. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, about some texts which influenced you? Oh, that's such an enormous question. <laughs> all, the, all of the ones that I read, nearly. Um, it's very hard to answer that. Well, it's because, you know, we're quite late into the human experience, so lots of other people have had time to describe very beautifully what it's like to be here. And I guess that's the thing. I'm always looking for, within writing as well, I'm often looking for just even, it might be a single phrase that captures the precision that you recognize. And I think that's the thing. I'm always as much as I'm always trying to uh, undermine dichotomies and undermine binaries and overcome the sense that things are opposite to each other because I think that's a fundamental misrecognition that humans have made because we're physically organized in a certain way. I'm also very, um, oh, I've forgotten the end of the sentence, I'm very attracted then, I'm attracted by the thing that I hate, I guess. So I find these moments when somebody else describes Oh yeah, recognition, sorry, recognition. I'm always moving between feeling incredibly alienated 
by pretty much everything or else having this sort of intimate falling in love with the statue because it's got really beautiful knees. And I think it's the same with books. It's about, I think being alive is a constant sort of negotiation of your proximity to reality. And sometimes you feel close to the world and you feel like you're in the world and of it. And sometimes it becomes a big meaningless mess and it doesn't feel like there's any good reason to be here because it's in such a terrible state, if you know what I mean. And what are you reading at the moment? Oh, Agatha Christie. <laughs> I was really nervous about coming here. So I brought Agatha Christie to keep me company. And uh, I'm also, it's very good. Somebody wrote about her in the LRB recently, so that gave me uh, a reassurance that it was intellectually not disrespectful. But I'm trying to read about the Renaissance. I'm reading about Francis I, who has very beautiful feet in a sculpture in Saint-Denis, and Henry VIII, and various other people who are knocking around, shaping the world that we inhabit now. That's my... Uh, Wonderful. One more question before we open it up is, you know, Daniel talked about introducing Lena, you know, about sculpture and, uh, you know, the idea of uh, sculpture in relation to, to our theme. Now, sculpture plays an increasingly important role in, in your work, and there is recently also more large-scale sculpture, which has, a, you know, a great capacity in your work to kind of realize very, in a very elaborate way, you know, but also direct way, the uncertainties of the, you know, questing in a way of consciousness. And it's interesting that actually arriving in Dublin, for those of you uh, when you go next to Dublin, it's exciting because the first thing literally you see when you get out of the airport is this great sculpture by you. And it's a very monument monumental sculpture, yet at the same time it's not heavy at all. Mm. So I was kind of curious if you can talk a little bit more about that, about sculpture and your recent kind of, you know, going into, into more large-scale work. Yeah, well, before I did the airport sculpture, I think the largest thing I had made was this, and that was then nine meters tall. Um, I guess scale is, I mean, scale is interesting, but, but I'm, I'm still always working on a very human scale. I want to have that very direct, I'm very interested in that physical response to work, and I think, I mean, it's a long time since it wasn't really talked about in a way, but it did not get talked about. You know, art was very retinal for a long time, so I'm always amplifying the fact that I sort of have um, wrong relationships with the world, like, because I think there's something about wanting people to know that, oh, no, this sounds ridiculous. I think it's perfectly valid and interesting to go into a museum and fall in love with objects for the wrong reason. You don't necessarily have to understand things to respond to them in a kind of physical way, and then you can figure that out afterwards. But it's just, I'm in a really, really straightforward way, you take some material and you make a shape and then meaning is happening in the world in a way that it wasn't happening before and I'm completely fascinated by that and if I can make something that has a certain kind of um, is compelling and it's attractive and this is a little bit might sound a little bit whimsical but I used to describe certain works as having kind of bedroom eyes and that they look at you and they're winking from across the room and they're beautiful and I'm really interested in color but when you approach them um, the hand goes up. And, and I think that's the sort of fundamental thing is that we're always, like I keep saying, I'm trying to get closer to the world, but I keep hitting these walls of like not understanding. And if I can make that physically happen with you know, sculptural objects, that makes me happy. That's the moment to open it up for your questions to Isabel Noah. Do we have questions from you? Otherwise I've got many more questions, but we wanted to open it. <laughs> Yeah, I thought, and maybe when we talk more, you know, some questions will pop up. Um, the characters, you know, there is this show which prompted mm. us really to talk about it, you know, because it's, it's very directly related to the theme, which you did uh, basically in Dublin. It was called Calling on Gravity. Mm. And um, Martin Herbert wrote a great review of it and, and writes that, you know, these four characters appearing in your usual light touch, watery oil paintings, might guide you through it, you know? Soprano, then the theologian, cosmologist Giordano Bruno, the philosopher, activist Simone Weil, and the artist Paul Teck, whom you talked about a lot. And each of them has, you know, a strange, says Herbert, category scrambling mix of the mystical and the rational. So it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about the show, you know, and about these four characters and about the mix of the mystical and the rational, which is there. 
Well, I mean, the calling on gravity, the title came from this. I think humans are always calling on gravity because we, and when we want to make something impressive or important, we, we turn to verticality and we turn to height. And we're trying to, as I was sort of trying to, you know, get to the beginning of the time, we're trying in some way to escape the surface of the Earth. And I don't quite understand it um, because I think if we liked the Earth more, we might treat it better. Um, so there's a, and it might be much more sort of metaphoric or something like that, but particularly in the English language, is completely um, corrupted or has evolved in such a way that would suggest that any kind of downness or lowness is this like really negative thing. So I was trying to understand, so I had a lot of photographs of feet in the show because I was trying to sort of love feet and like the way in which the human, so they're always like culturally derided and sort of like people make jokes about people who have a foot fetish. Nobody makes jokes about somebody having a face fetish. And I don't quite understand why there's sort of this disgusting part of the body. So I was trying to think about how to love the world by loving feet more and sort of setting that against these uh, sculptures that were sort of making reference. You saw some of the kind of chandelier pieces earlier to sort of failed grandeur. So to make grandeur into something that's physically engaging and sort of beautiful. And I'm really, really, really attracted to mystical thinkers, to people like Vey, and particularly maybe Giordano Bruno and Paul Tech, who I maybe have far less of an understanding of than other people in this room, so I have to be careful about what I say. But I love these mystical thinkers, but I don't, uh, I don't buy into their commitments. I don't believe in God um, or divinity of any kind, but I'm absolutely fascinated by the way those three people try to love the world and try to love the universe in this completely anti-hierarchical way. And they try and see everything in the universe as being connected. And I think that's a really fantastic way, but I'm trying to do it with secular ideas and not invoke higher powers and not invoke afterlives or transcendence or eternity. I just, you know, trying to appreciate being here now. Um, and then Tony Soprano was my kind of evil rationalist who, there's a quote from, I think it's the first episode of The Bra Sopranos, where I don't know if everybody knows it, it's like a TV show about gangsters in New Jersey. And he says, you are born to this shit. You are what you are. So he was like the devil in my sort of, uh, in my um, thing. But he's also so attractive and he's so sexy. And within the TV show, he's an evil psychopath, but you want him to win. So for me, he got really mixed up. Oh, here, is he there? That's supposed to be. <laughs> He's really, really, he got mixed up in my head. He hates art. It's also this sort of small kind of character trait. He really hates art and he hates any elitist sort of nonsense. So he got mixed up in my head with the Kunstdarsche Museum because it's such a big kind of patriarchal institution and it's built on blood. But I would go there every day and I would be so happy and I would love it. And then I would feel bad for loving it. So it's like I felt bad for loving Tony. So I put Tony in the museum because I wanted to punish them both for <laughs> making me love them. So. Now, this is brilliant. And now, I know we are out of time, but uh, Daniel rightly so said, uh, you know, I cannot end this without actually asking you uh, the question on your unrealized project. Oh, Daniel, yeah. is right. <laughs> Daniel is right. And obviously, we have here Giordano Bruno. And you know, in my last meeting with Cornelis, I had talked to him about his incredible live projects, you know, with, uh, with live elements in exhibition, asked him about his unrealized project. And he wanted to build a monument, actually, to Giordano Bruno. It's oh, an okay. unrealized project. But I wanted to ask you if there have been any projects which have been too big to be realized or too small to be realized. Well, I'm totally going to explain it now because I want to very quite famous film directors to turn things that I've written into films. It's going to involve huge amounts of work on their part. But I wrote a science fiction piece called The Three Body Problem. I think I wrote it before, I, knew, I definitely wrote it before I knew that the Six in Lu, the Chinese. Um, so that's going to involve a lot of CGI because I'm interested in the idea that if the world that we lived in um, was in a three body system, which means we would have three suns, that we wouldn't have this binary of night and day and everything would be different, and the whole kind of metaphoric basis of the human world that we're familiar with would be undone by the fact that we would live in this twilight world of changing light. And in the world, film gets invented first, and then finally drawing gets invented as the most radical outcome of the invention of film. So you know, maybe I won't explain the second one, but there's another movie. It'll be fantastic. Very exciting. And now we have an urgent question from Svetlana. Oh. Uh, it has to be a short question, a short answer, because otherwise I'm in trouble. 
like it's actually two questions, <laughs> very short ones. Yes, what is it uh, your place of perpetual confusion? Is it impossibility of knowledge or it is uh, a sequence of contradictory beliefs, experiences through life? This is number one. And the second one, do you think it's possible to create from non-confused meditative state of mind? Or is it two same paths leading to the same way? Um, I think the first bit is the kind of contingency. And so it's, it's and yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that, the kind of contingency of knowledge, which I think is fantastic and fascinating. And I always want to know more. But, you know, there is a level of understanding, but even the word level is incorrect, but yeah. It's fundamentally, I guess, it's the fact that things shift. It doesn't make things wrong, but it makes them uh, subject to change in a way that's very fascinating. So I get very puzzled by people who um, are very evangelical, I guess. And I, frankly, now I actually have forgotten the second question. But I lie on the floor <laughs> and Maybe. think about things a lot, so I think that probably is a yes. Okay, great. Thank you very Isabel much. Isabel Nolan, thank, thank you, you so much. A big round of applause for Isabel Nolan. really successful in that. Maybe on the question you will get it, that kind of things. Um, and the video is still in process. I'm sorry for that, because uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could understand that I'm, uh, how can I say? I mean, I, I am an architect under construction, you know? It's all, <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I really don't have a line in my, in my work. I don't have any. Uh, still on practice, and then this video was, was about this practice, about that. And um, the video is about characters, three of them that I got in the, in the last two or three years. Um, characters mean persons, you know, I mean, mean that. It's about materiality, um, it's about projects. Some of them mean three of them, two. Um, Maybe it's, I wrote here, maybe it's about the history of some characters, of some materials, of some of my projects. Maybe it's, that is the, the video. Um, for me, uh, the video could be a deep, naive way to think and to explain what mean the game of gravity and grace for me. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a way to explain you, it's a way to play in the same game. Um, maybe more about gravity, more uh, or less about grace, but it's going to be funny to see it uh, with you, this, this video. Uh, we could start with the video. B was conceived out of the imagination of the American cartoonist Rose O'Neill. In short time, this booty, with her candid and mischievous look, became a toy produced at a massive scale, thanks to celluloid, a light, manipulable material that directly preceded plastic. In 1925, QB was the image for a mayonnaise that bore her name in Japan and had begun a career in favor of human rights while supporting women's suffrage. She also faced extreme threats. Monsters like Godzilla, created by the Toho Studios in 1954. In each battle the modern and heavy cities that had replaced the previous wooden cities burned down in the wars, toppled like light cheap toys at the blows of these larger-than-life monsters. QB is the arrival of Grace.
Our sad city would accumulate in his camouflaged body. The plastic man is a homeless man and like the writer, Diamela Eltit says, the body of the homeless is shreds of newspaper, fragments of extermination, syllables of death, pauses of lies, commercial slogans, names of the deceased. It is a deep crisis of language, an infection in memory, a disarticulation of all ideologies. It is a pity. The plastic man is the man under gravity.
translucent PTFE enhances this strange feeling. Makes it in some respects a distant cousin to a light circus 10. Standing in the city's border. The circus is fiction, a grin of made-up reality. If we could see it, as we should, in a photo upside down, it would seem to be hanging from the earth. That's why the circus has no foundations, it's slight dead weight. It is fastened to the ground gravity which moves under its feet, spinning round, pirouetting. The Bio Bio Regional Theater is the possible skeleton of a wrapped theater. Inside, the spectator will move through a special reticule that stupidly appears to be measuring each corner. In the main body of the theater, as in Martin Perrier's sculpture, this path loses saturation and gives the air needed for the representation. A black air. A darkness with misty edges. The visitor has only to see the cloth that falls over the building, failing it then to feel or sense, as Contour says that something is hidden inside or at least to believe for a moment that moving around inside it will be an experimental process or one that is at least surprising. When the concrete fragile skeleton appear random illuminated, the show is open. To one side of the highway, plastic bags tied to sticks float with the wind of the passing cars. These grocery bags are abstract poor commercial signs. Small-scale cheese vendors use them to attract the attention of motorists moving along the only highway that runs to the north of Chile. Their movement has the light grace of a cheap bag flying out of control in a whirlwind of hot air or that of a skirt billowing out from the passing of the subway. Marilyn is the sadness of the grace. A bubble inflated and built using nylon parachute cloth was the solution used for the Celine Pavilion for Paris Fashion Week 2017. We try to produce an elegant, soft and young pavilion without creases. As a Phoebe Philo garment, The show lasted eight minutes and took place on a group of tennis courts on the outskirts of Paris. A hostile interior that we had to hide during the catwalk show. Therefore, quickly inflating a space as if it were a 1960s performance piece seemed a good idea. We initially designed a bubble using systems of patterns and modeling with a double curve to avoid touching the side of the existing buildings. Especially the columns. Thereby generating a fully autonomous and wrinkle-free interior space.
But after one month of work trying to obtain a clean and soft bubble with this overdone method of construction for our eight minutes of life. Sometimes it is not about working with the available technology but quite the opposite, it is about avoiding the supposed advantage technology. I decided to inflate a simple and giant plane bag with a banal geometry, which as it was inflated to its full size, settled into the surrounding space making the structure of the existing building an unwilling model for its shape. The chosen material, something similar to a thick silk, sewn as a garment. gave the whole structure a textile and sensual appearance thanks to the creases. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. Universe man never said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. Thank you very much, uh, Smilian, for this fantastic presentation. Uh, thanks also for, for, for making it for this event, <laughs> custom made. Mm -hmm. um, custom made, yeah. Yeah, uh, before there's <laughs> going to be the <laughs> first question, because mm -hmm. I can't see mm -hmm. the questions anyway, I'll ask the first question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, Looking at your projects, uh, my, my first idea was, yeah, it's, it's uh, because I, I was starting with the, the depiction of big boulders of rocks. Yeah, this is kind of obvious that it's, mm. uh, it's dealing with the relation of the building to the ground and gravity. Mm. And looking at this, it seems as if, um, if gravity was almost missing, uh, as if there was not enough uh, gravity, uh, if gravity was not a given. Usually, architecture is something which resists gravity because mm. it's there, but it seems that in your case, it's almost turned around. Uh, so how do you deal with gravity? Is this, is this a given or do you have to make it? Um, I mean, th this is the first time that I think in the problem, you know, it's about gravity. It's, it's normally, it's about, it's about the game with the materiality. It's a tecton tectonic game in, in the sense you have to play with each material um, but always I because that I I do in this way I put some history in between I mean uh, mean in the last part that when you think you could think that gravity is not the gravity is really is really there because 
it's for me, the important thing is in that way was in, when you are in, inside of a bubble, you feel the weight of the earth more than you don't feel the weight. I mean, the weight is really important. And if you have this, this um, kind of silk, it's getting weight by themselves. And it's really beautiful uh, way to understand the things. But for me, uh, the gravity, it's uh, always there, m maybe because I'm really close of my wife, but that is a sculpture. It really, we, we work on it, uh, all hanging things and everything. Always is there, but it's something you know, natural. We are not thinking about. We are not thinkers at the end. We, I'm, I would say, I'm, I'm an architect on practice. I just on practice and on the practice, I could find the way to do it. For example, for Celine was how I choose this bubble because it's coming from the 60s and uh, I love the 60s and uh, I think oh it's it's a good idea to inflate it something and that's it. It's uh, it's a show and then was really beautiful. Um, before that, we bought, we bought a collection of uh, bubbles of uh, Utopie Group, and then I always try to put my work in, uh, in the history of architecture at the end from Chile, you know, and that is really important to me inside of something. And then I'm not working on, the, on, on that theme. I work on that theme because it's, it's, it, was, it was a case, you know. I prepared this just for this case, but I could maybe talk about the structure or the, another thing. So it's, it's, it's about to, un I, I said at the beginning, I tried to understand and to explain better my work in relation with that, you know, in relation with your theme. And that is important for me. And it's, more, it's important you could understand that. You know? Yes, yeah, sp speaking of, of history, uh, remember when we had the opening of your show, this is a collection of uh, utopian projects. Uh, uh, from the late 50s, 60s, early 70s, uh, kind of the, the never built uh, a project. Uh, and I asked you, why do you collect all this? And you said, because uh, in Chile we were disconnected. We'd never had that. So it, as if you never had this uh, possibility of an utopia. Now it seems as if you were kind of feeling responsible to, to complete that. No? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for for me, it's really important not to bring Chilean architect to Europe. It's to bring Europe architect to Chile. It's I mean, my clients, not my clients, my students. I I don't I don't teach because I don't like it. But my my reference are the students, you know, of the 40 school of architects in Chile. And then I have to bring because normally we thought that you you always have architect all around you because in. But in Chile, you could not find really easy that. And then, and then this architecture I mean, between the 50s and 70s, the real architecture was uh, just on the drawings. And then when I collect this that kind of drawing, I really collecting architecture. And then I could bring this architecture to Chile and then to show real architecture. And there, there are documents really important in that collection. But the, the, the end of this travel is about to, to teach something there. I mean, not to go ahead to bring architect to around the world, you know. And then uh, when I when I do this kind of things, uh, the Serpentine Pavilion, that it was really, really because Julia Payton and Hans Ulrich pushed me to do something that was, was really stressed and that I, I don't recommend to anybody to do that kind of things. I mean, in th three months to produce something always was uh, because I have these uh, elements just produced, this, this folie, I, I produced this folie before, and this was really beautiful because I, for example, about gravity, I was uh, thinking at that time in, in, the, in the Mestiz restaurant with the rocks, and it's really in structurally, you know, for the earthquake. But in the pali pavilion if, uh, and in, in, the, in the London, you never know what is real and what is false, what is structural and what is not, you know? It's something that Cedric Price know, knew really good and described this beautiful descript description about the romantic folie. And then it's really beautiful to think what is heavy, what is not heavy, what is full, what is true. Not like uh, for normal, I mean, for the almost of all of the architect normally, you have to be really honest, you know? And in the folie, you don't have to be honest. You have to be really folie. And that is beautiful, I mean, in the sense of gravity and... Uh, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's, mm. amazing, it's be beautiful. And, uh, it's it's uh, a challenge now uh, to kind of you know, um, identify uh, a specific attitude, style uh, in, in your work. Uh, it seems as if you are many architects. No? 
uh, doing uh, every time something completely new, as if mm. as if you would be a new, a new, almost a new person. Uh, mm. uh, how, how how does this happen? Um, it it was really funny because I when 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 the crocus came in 2014 you know, to Chile to take shooting pictures to do the monograph. I saw the monograph after came to Chile and, 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 and I saw the monograph and I saw, oh, maybe could be not the same architect doing that project, you know what I mean? It's a, a really schizophrenic. Um, but right now I'm, I'm getting more normal <laughs> in the sense that I could repeat something and I do again and, and just work on it, not to be really confused about what I could do. And that is good and that is bad, but I, I have families of things that I have to think. And the grace of the, or maybe the ideas, came just in few times, you know? You are not saying I could do new every, I mean new, and it's with property, something with property every day, because you are, I'm not really successful in that. I mean, I'm not really on my, on my work. I mean, in the sense of, I mean, I am on work, but, but my work is really limited. I have five people working with me and that's it. And then I, I could not invent something. I mean, I mean, they came from everywhere. It's, it's maybe from Marilyn or maybe from QP. And, and, and that is really exciting at the end because you are not preparing to do something new. I mean, and it's, it's really, I mean, for me, it's normal because I could stop when I want, you know? I mean, not really like that, that but <laughs> I could stop. <laughs> I try to stop. Yeah, well, uh, one, three minutes, one minute. Uh, one que uh, is there a question? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what does gravity mean in your country uh, where there is the risk of the um, earthquake? You show this example with the building and it seems to be very light, like mm. floating. Mm. Um, it is, I mean, um, it's, uh, it was, uh, I could explain the contest. The contest, I mean, the, 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 the earthquake was uh, just 50 kilometers from there. I mean, it was really, really huge earthquake, 8.8 .8 from this place. and near from there fall down two buildings, you know, and, and then the, the contest was after that, one year after that, and, uh, and the people was really afraid about, you know, the, the, um, the condition of the earth structures. And, uh, and that time was really funny because the contest said, you have to use a huge structure to feel really strong. And we made the opposite, to have really, uh, 30 by 30 columns and beams and everything, and this structure sounds really light, and we put in a sand, compact sand, and we just made a, this slab working with, with the top. And then, give, uh, at the beginning, we have 25 by 25, the columns, and, and we feel it's so fragile. It, you, you will feel fall down the, 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 the building. And then we said, the engineer said, you, are, you, you don't have to do this, you have to increase because the, the, the building will be filled, fall down. And that is gravity, you know? And then I, w I am not artist, and then I have to produce the sensation of security if you, if you want, you know? It's, at the end, it's my work about that. And we increase to 30 by 30. But with, with this small uh, structure that is all around the, 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 the building. But it's always it's about case by case. I could, I could not have uh, a recommendation, you know. It's, a, it's, a, it's always something special, you know. It's, uh, mm. Mm. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, lawyers, for an instance, have to change uh, in every region, how is it within architecture for you to work in so many different countries with the regulations or how, how do you see the differences between working in Chile and in London, for an instance? Um, I mean, uh, in London, we, we are just restoring a place, you know, it's uh, for Alexander McQueen uh, in Old Bond Street. It's uh, 1,000 square meters of uh, retail, you know, and it was so funny because they were normally in Europe You work with the limit of security, you know, and that is really important. We in Chile work with the limit of insecurity, you know, we are in the in this band And we still working on that, you know, we, you could do it still work, but 
Right now, it's getting more not so easy. It's getting more, you know, not. But you could. It's like uh, uh, we 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 talk uh, days before with Pierre Hughes about installation. You could still in the in between uh, Europe building on an installation. And you are we are still in 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 the middle of this range, you know. And that is uh, give you some possibilities if you could get it. It's not really easy to. You got it. I mean, it's it's not about uh, it's yeah. It's about Matt Brancy call, uh, talk about that. And Brancy said, normally we, we work with uh, in 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 Italy in the 70s we work with the limited of insecurity and we're still there. I think, I hope. <laughs> it's, uh, so all these conversations have to end with the question of Hans Ulrich about the unrealized project. I will, I will flip this around because you like to flip things around. I will, I will tell you what your unrealized project okay. is and end with a wish. Please do teach. <laughs> Thank you so much for Smiljan. Okay, Hedgy, are you here? Okay. Okay, um, we're entering with Heiji uh, uh, Shin. Thanks for coming. We're entering a bit into the field of disgrace, and um, and I invited her for a show, and that's what I got uh, from her show as a reaction. So um, please welcome Heiji Shin to um, this talk. It starts with an introduction by Heiji, and then it goes over into a short conversation between the two to figure out uh, that thing th there. Thank you, Hedge, for coming. Uh, Daniel, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, um, like Daniel and me, we just talked about that um, I give a short introduction to my work because most of them don't know my work and at the moment, there is the exhibition in the Kunsthalle Zurich. And when you know my work before, it maybe resolves and makes better sense um, at the end. So, uh, yeah, I chose this one uh, as the first uh, work. That is a work from 2012, I think. It's, it was in one of my first New York exhibitions. And uh, I chose that because <coughs> because I kind of associated it with, with Switzerland, not because of the bank. I thought like there were like all these like people and there's a kind of mountain behind and it looks a little bit like as people like hiking in the mountains. So um, the show was called uh, The Great Penetrator and um, yeah, so This work um, is actually a part of an exhibition that I showed in Zurich, in the Gallery Bernhard, and uh, it shows a female monkey. Um, it was back then, in 2013 or 14, was inspired by like, um, actually a hashtag on Instagram called ha hashtag lonely girl. And um, I discovered this hashtag and saw a lot of like female, um, beautiful, attractive women more or less, um, hashtagging her selfies like this. 
and I thought like, well, this is kind of, um, when it's a selfie, it's like also like, of course, like ref referential to me, like, so this is like me in 2013, 14, and this is me 2019, I guess. Um, so it, the monkey is, um, yeah, either like, yeah, a suicidal monkey before, like after counting money and um, shooting, shooting guns. Um, then the next work is the work that I've shown in New York in a gallery that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's, these are kind of portraits of infants in the process of coming out of the mother's womb, but you only see the head because the body is still in, in the womb. But it's a kind of classical portrait, I guess. I mean, I could say a lot about these birth photos, but I think I prefer to say nothing because they are quite intense and... <laughs> okay, uh, this, this one is actually like a show that um, I've done last year at Rina Spawnings. And um, it was actually uh, at the height of the Me Too movement. And I was thinking why masculinity is such a problem, like in contemporary art right now. And I wanted to do something on it. Like, and it was a very special kind of exhibition because I wanted to appropriate like homosexual culture as much as possible. And I, um, yeah, I was like trying to identify myself as a, as a gay man for like several months to do this show. And it shows like these like models dressed up um, as policemen, as ho pretty hot cops. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty hot. Um, so what I was doing is actually, I was, I was um, organizing in the gallery, the shoot in the gallery, and um, it was actually like a gay police officer uh, porn. And you see like this, the cast was from like Craigslist. You see like um, two guys in the act. Um, the bottom is holding a book. And then you see like a shadow like in the corner of a policeman like surveilling and uh, checking on, on what he sees there in the gallery. So here you see like, um, yeah, in a very classical position, like two policemen. And this was actu actually inspired by, um, by a work that is by a very iconic gay artist, everybody knows, him, it's Tom of Finland, and this was the inspiration. Yeah, you see? So, in the next one you see like um, a naked, like undressed police officer with a dressed police officer. So he's reading this book, and this book, you might ask yourself like what he's reading, and it's um, a Schopenhauer book. And the Schopenhauer book is I don't know if you know this book, it's called On Women. And um, it's a pretty interesting book. I mean, it's a book, Schopenhauer was like a little bit frustrated uh, about women because of like probably like disappointing experiences. And this book is, um, I would say like, or like people would say it's very misogynist. And you see, this dressed policeman like actually surveilling the other policeman while reading this book. So uh, this looks like a birth, but it is not a birth. But it's a little bit like formally it's a birth. <laughs> uh, 
but it's one of the explicit like detail shots um, that I took when I shot the gay porn. Okay, so the next one. Okay, this one. Um, this one is, um, there's uh, like Eckhaus Lata, like it's an American, very young uh, fashion label. And um, they asked me to do a fashion campaign, like a very conventional fashion campaign for them. And I wanted to do, or like what I did was like, I, um, I was casting real couples having sex in front of the camera. And what you see is like, of course, they're having sex, but you can't see anything really. Like it's very deceitful actually. Like you, you imagine what you see, but at the end you don't see anything else than you see maybe another um, advertising. I mean, in terms of nudity. So, but this was a very controversial um, um, advertising campaign. It got a lot of comments. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another one. Well, you, but I mean, it could have been all staged, so you don't know, you know, like, so, so I was really surprised that people got very uh, um, upset about it because um, at the end you don't even know if it's true. It's just maybe like a playful, playful suggestion. Um, okay, what's next? Ah, yeah, okay, so here, we, <laughs> this is actually what, like, Daniel and me, we will talk about. Um, mainly um, in our talk. So this is Kanye West. Um, I photographed him um, after I sent him an email that I wanted to show him. This show actually, or like this, I produced the show, or like I shot his portrait right after uh, the very big controversy he caused uh, with like um, different, um, maybe incoherent and contradictory uh, statements he did, uh, political statements he, he did um, while before and after the Oval Office meeting with Trump. And um, yeah, so these are like really like, it's kind of, it's a wallpaper, it's like, glued to the wall, they're very, very big, like they're around like four meters. You can't, you can't see the proportions here, but uh, you can see the proportions. This is one of the very like, very simple portraits, but you can see like how tall, how big they're, pr they're printed and attached to the wall. So, um, okay, like, this exhibition like um, really caused like much more controversy than actually the Eckhaus Lada sh shoot. And I was expecting a little bit of it, but not as much as uh, actually happened and it's still happening right now. Um, I'm still getting like very um, upset um, complaints about, about the show. Uh, and these complaints, they look a little bit like this. <coughs> these were like around like, so this was a post that, that happened. I mean, this, so Art Forum actually posted um, the show. And normally they have a lot of followers and normally they, they get maybe 30 comments, which are positive most, most of the time. This, my show got around like 300 very negative comments, like throughout very negative comments the first three days. Uh, <laughs> so like here's some worst show ever. Oh yeah, yeah, this is like the, the lower one is one of my favorite ones. I'm a starving artist and you post this shit. Like this, this was very, um, yeah, that was really revealing. I, uh, I also, I felt a little bit sorry about that. 
So now that there we have like Peter Nagy. Peter Nagy is actually like, I don't know, people probably know him. He is um, an artist and curator or even a gallerist, a gallerist. And he's very much into, I think, folkloric Indian art. I'm, I'm not sure about that anymore, but, but also like this kind of time to find the curator at the cut set. As, I mean, like, of course he's English speaking, but it had a kind of like a weird connotation. I, I was like, hmm, okay. And then of course you see on the second, the second comment you see, um, <coughs> It's more revealing in what kind of, um, like in, in what, why the show has been so controversial for some people, like because you see like this person, Jimmy, 49, Irfan, he can see it, like he, he really means it and he, he means like, Politically, it's not or it's not okay to to show Kanye at that time in an institution, right? And and then there's a more emotional one, Gross, uh, which I also liked, and um, yeah. So, oh yeah, these are nice emojis. Okay, so like um, accompanied with with the Kanye um, portraits, I showed another work, another body of work, which are like actually self-portraits. And these self-portraits I, I took in uh, Mexico, in Mexico City. And these are like x-ray portraits of myself holding um, different kinds of like lab dogs or kind of expensive dogs. You see like, like the reference I have there like kind of once the surface and once you see the transparent transparent version of <laughs> of it. Um, so I um, so these works these were much smaller these works, but they were like actually installed right next to the very huge Kanye West photos and and. I was like a little bit suggesting, I mean, these are so different works that you can't even, I mean, you you wonder why I would show this next to a huge Kanye um, portrait. And this was, this was like, formally, it didn't make so much sense to me, but I was thinking like, maybe I could suggest something to the viewer when you see this very huge Kanye that who they show only like very big surface and they're really unpenetrable. But then I have myself portrait there and you see like complete transparency. And there's of course the question that comes up, do you see much more? Like if you see much more and probably you see even less. Um, yeah, I think this is, this, this was a very, very short introduction to to my work, and um, I think we will continue with Daniel and me. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe we just open it to the public, and otherwise I, I ask a question. There's just one thing I wanted to say is, um, it's interesting to close this uh, Saturday, having Adin Art talk with you because I think, or it made me think about something, you know, maybe with social media, we're moving somehow beyond gravity and grace. And it's, uh, so that's, I'm, it's just something I'm saying. I'm not sure if it is true. I should thought <laughs> it's a thought. So, um, yeah, so I'm th therefore I'm happy that uh, we ended with uh, this. So, <laughs> questions? Hi, thank you. I was wondering, um, when you were going through the choice uh, for working with Kenya, was it because you wanted something controversial and to see people's reactions? Or was there, what was the actual intention mm -hmm. that drew you to him? And, and okay. how was your experience after you met him and worked with him? Okay, so um, I like Kanye's music a lot. I really like respect him as an artist. 
but I wasn't really interested in him to make art about him or like I wasn't, I never thought about it. Even when he did all these like very um, contra like contradictory and coherent uh, statements in the Oval Office, I was like, I, I wasn't even very interested in that. I mean, no, I was, but more in a, I was entertained. I, every time I read about him, I was entertained. I thought it was funny. He was the only celebrity that I like to read about and still like to read about because he's very exciting personality. But to make art about him, I never, it never crossed my mind. It crossed my mind at that point when I saw the reactions to what he did. So like all this upset, uh, People, uh, he, he received threats that I could see on his like very temporary Instagram. Um, media was very mad at him. Um, and, but then there were like very few, like very, um, yeah, very few comments also like he should have the right to do it. In a way, I thought that's really interesting what actually is what he mirrors like what kind of like what people like the people's projection in him and in, on both sides because you love him for what he has done as an artist but then you hate him for what he said uh, politically or like yeah i don't know politically mostly and maybe I can add to this that um, when when uh, I invited Hedge for shows, um, you came up with this idea of, you know, a, a series of portrait of pe of controversial people, and um, and I think in the end, and then you said, okay, uh, there was several ones, Hillary Clint Clinton or Stephen Bannon, but yeah. then you came up, I would like to do. Um, um, Kanye West, and I think it was a, I, I really liked the idea because, you know. Within the art world, somebody like Stephen Bannon, everybody hates him, almost everybody hates him. But with Kanye West, it's extremely complicated. Few people in the art world or in the culture world, in the music world, have extremely controversial um, feelings about him. So it seemed like the right person to address <laughs> this complicated story. Yeah. Um... I forgot what I wanted to say about that. Maybe somebody has, has a question. Uh, oh, yeah, all the way in the back, wait. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, there's also like, of course, like um, I get, uh, still I get like a lot of um, messages uh, from different social medias media platforms, and they ask me why I did that, like it's, it's exactly the question that you, uh, that you just asked. And, um, and I was really thinking about this, like what actually like is implied in the question, why would you give a person a platform, like such a platform as uh, like a Swiss recognized, very respectable institution. And I have to say that I don't think that this, this, um, the question of plat to give somebody a platform or deplatform somebody or like to validate somebody is, is something that is a very interesting question in art, right? Like, I think it's the one of the most boring questions because this is not what I want. I mean, if you, if we think of platforms, then Kanye West is the biggest platform. He's so much bigger than, than uh, the like uh, the Consola Zurich and me. And when you, when you think of like the combination between <laughs> like the Kunsthalle Zurich, uh, him as the, as the m most celebrated male celebrity, um, rapper, musician, and then me, like I think there's one PC aspect, there's at least diversity in this combination of us. <laughs> Um, can you maybe tell us, did Kanye at all realize what type of work you did when you asked him to take the pictures? And has he reacted at all towards the show that you did? Or have you heard basically nothing from him? Um, 
Yes, uh, actually, I don't think he didn't know in what extent um, this show would, what like kind of significant, I mean, the thing is I wrote to him this email out of the blue. I got his email by accident, by chance. I was really lucky. Um, so I just wrote him an email and I was talking with him about um, artistic freedom and freedom of speech and all this over the email. And um, he, so there was something that he was interested in because he didn't know my work at all, nothing. So he said yes, because it kind of, there was something that he was interested in and I, 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 do, I do believe I know what it was. And then he saw the show, he saw everything, he had to approve the images, of course, because with a portrait, that's what you do, that's the most respectful thing you do. And then in my artistic practice, I can do whatever, put it in a context. And um, so he didn't expect that, really. He's a very like big admirer of art and supporter of art, uh, an artist himself. Um, he, I think, he was a bit surprised by the negative feedback, but he is also used to so much more controversies that he doesn't care. And he, I mean, I met him and I had to kind of convince him several times to do this with me. So there, is, he's very busy, like you can imagine, he's one of the busiest men. Um, so he did that, I think, out of intuition, almost. He didn't have to do that at all. Like, there's nothing he can gain from that. Um, okay, one more question. You will have the very last one. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much. I guess eroticism and celebrities were always, would always produce these fiery reactions in society. Mm -hmm. Did you study similar situations from other historical periods? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, mean, I don't have to study them. They're very obvious and evident. Um, I, I just talked with um, <clears throat> yesterday with a person about it. And um, so in the Whitney at the moment is a show of Andy Warhol. And uh, um, of course, everybody knows his work and he showed, uh, well, like the Whitney showed, huge, gigantic portraits of Mao Zedong and the Shah of Iran and of other very powerful people that I think are very mu much more morally difficult or like politically difficult. So, so you can also just kind of like approach it as or like the significance of this work as a sign of time, like, you know? But it's, it has always been done. There was a show in, in the Met just a few months ago, De La Croix. It's, it's actually, it's almost, yeah, everywhere <laughs> in art history, yeah. Could I, Hans Ulrich? <laughs> And, and, and as you know, we're all around, so you can ask also hedgy questions uh, any time. Uh, um, we're ending with uh, the last question. Uh, you know, the famous last question by Hans Henry. Yeah, Daniel said I, I should not, not ask that question, so here is the question. And I was really, really interested in, you know, your unrealized portraits, because I spoke to, I spoke to Hans-Peter Fellmann, um, about that, the German artist around uh, yeah. 2000, and he was really obsessed to photograph the Queen model, you know, Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. It was very old then, she passed away in 2002, and we tried everything to make it possible. It was oh, possible. Yeah, yeah. So that remained unrealized. You know, and uh, already I spoke to Zanelli Muholi, she really wanted to photograph Desmond Tutu. I always think it's interesting, the unrealized portrait. Uh, yeah. Is there, uh, after all the work you now shown us, somebody, you want to photograph? Oh them? my God, so many people. Can you tell us? Oh, so many people. You don't even know. Like, I, I, I could think of so many people. And I really, like, I really think, like, um... <laughs> okay, so of course, Hillary Clinton was, like, the alternative to Kanye West. It's a very different kind of um, 
personality. Um, sh but she would have been great, and uh, is her smiling in the Kunsthalle Zurich, that would have been so creepy, you know? <laughs> that would have been so great. But then, of course, you have like more this like kind of like villains that, uh, that are running around, and everybody's very upset about them. So Stephen Bannon was, um, was somebody that I was interested in. Jordan Peterson, the psychologist who refuses really like, like yeah, he refuses to use um, these non-binary pronouns. And then, you know, you have like, oh my God, like you have Joe Rogan, like you, like pot, like at the moment, like YouTubers, like a lot of like YouTubers I really find very interesting. Um, politicians, and Melania. She's the most iconic. Like, I love her. I think she looks so great. I think she's the most beautiful and the most elegant and graceful. Graceful? That's what we're talking about. Graceful first lady ever in history of America. <laughs> okay, we close on this one. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, two things, two things I have to tell everybody. So there is a apero, a drink around the corner at Gallery Judy. You have, uh -huh, and, and uh, Monica Cardenas, two of the very beautiful Swartz galleries. Go see them both. Not only you will see beautiful and great art, but amazing spaces. So uh, one is around the corner there, the other one around the corner there. And second announcement I have to uh, make is um, there are shuttle buses going back and uh, uh, up and down to uh, Hotel Castel because Cecilia Bengolea will have a performance there at 8 on the ice rink. Please, uh, you're all invited. Shuttle buses up and down from 7 to 9 continuously. Thank you, everybody.